Thanks, Eileen, and uh, welcome, everybody, from my side. It's good to be back with you again um, after a bit of a, a break. I'm extremely grateful for the break, although it's, it's been a, a while um, since I got back to work. And so, as Eileen was saying, it's kind of, when's the next break coming? But, uh, but it is good to be able to be back with you this, this morning. Our call to worship this morning should be coming up on the overhead, and I invite you to respond with the words in bold. And so read those words in bold with me. I'll lead us with the others. And so, beloved disciples, welcome. We gather as people reconciled to one another and God through grace, a gift freely and lovingly given that we do not earn or deserve. We receive the marvellous work of grace in our lives, and we wonder, is it fair? No, God's grace is not fair, but a gift of God's mercy. We gather as neighbours who have experienced difficulties of every kind. We feel uncertain, fearful and overwhelmed, and we wonder, is it fair? No, our difficulties are not fair. And God's grace meets our uncertainty with mercy and love. We gather as a community that knows the suffering of our neighbours. We look at the effects of poverty, food insecurity and trauma in our neighbourhoods and we wonder, is it fair? No, the suffering of our neighbours is not fair. And God's grace calls us to respond to suffering with mercy and justice. We gather as people who question how to live into God's abundance and flourishing in a world built on scarcity and greed. And we wonder, is it fair? Yes, God's life of abundance and flourishing is fair because it is merciful. May God's grace form us into people of mercy, justice, compassion and truth telling as we gather today. Amen. And let's pray. Welcoming God, great is your love for us. When we are alone, you make us known to our siblings everywhere. When we are lonely, you whisper, come closer, inviting us into your heart. Accepting Christ, great is your grace for us. When we wander, lost and afraid, you take us by the hand so we may settle in your kingdom. When we hunger for the crumbs of hope which the world offers us, you feed us with the fullness of your joy. Embracing spirit, great is your hope for us. When those around us make clear they want nothing to do with us, you persist in being our friend. When we stand on despair's welfare line, you invite us to come to a sumptuous feast. Providing God, we admit that we have difficulties living as your children. We could live in unity, but our words fracture relationships with family and friends. We've been shown the way to your kingdom, but turn into blind guides when asked for directions by others. When we could offer others the precious oil of peace, we hand them the vinegar of despair and rejection. Have mercy on us, healing heart. When you call to us, may we listen with open ears, understand with embracing hearts, and share your grace with others, even as we have been graced by Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. God and community, Holy in one, you weep openly as you welcome us into your heart and your hopes. Even as we pray as Jesus taught us, we say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, 
that deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And so, friends, hear the good news. God has provided hope for you, filling you with joy and mercy, with peace. As mercy leads to mercy, may we take these gifts to share with the world. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 15, and verses 21 to 28. Jesus left that place and went off to the territory near the cities of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman who lived in that region came to him. Son of David, she cried out, have mercy on me, sir. My daughter has a demon and is in a terrible condition. But Jesus did not say a word to her. His disciples came to him and begged him, send her away. She's following us and making all this noise. Then Jesus replied, I have been sent only to the lost sheep of the people of Israel. At this, the woman came and fell at his feet. Help me, sir, she said. Jesus answered, It isn't right to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. That's true, sir, she answered, but even the dogs eat the leftovers that fall from their master's table. So Jesus answered her, You are a woman of great faith. What you want will be done for you. And at that very moment, her daughter was healed. Thanks be to God for this word to us. Now, friends, this is quite a difficult passage to relate to, um, especially, I think, during this Women's Month when we're focusing on the atrocities done to women. And we hear Jesus responding in this way, firstly, just completely ignoring this woman's cries for help, then talking to his disciples in her presence as a, as a rebuttal, and then referring to her uh, in a kind of roundabout way as, as a dog. And so this doesn't really fit in with our picture of Jesus, or does it? If we look a little bit closer and we, we look at the context and the background, we, we come a little bit closer, I think, to understanding what might be going on here. Firstly, we need to note that Matthew's Gospel is written primarily for a Jewish audience. There are hints and clues the whole way through that, that show that Matthew's Gospel is written specifically for a Jewish audience. And then secondly, we need to remember that Jesus' teaching style was through parables. Whether parables spoken or parables acted out. But he would, he would say things or he would do things that were meant to teach a lesson. And then we need to note that in the story that we just read, Jesus, we're told, leaves Israel and goes out to the land of the Gentiles. We're told, goes to the territory near the cities of Tyre and Sidon. Now, if you know anything about the history of the Jewish people at that particular time and the nation of Israel, Tyre and Sidon were the, was, was a place of, of not, was not such a good place, a place where they didn't have good relationships. They might have at one stage, but Jezebel was a princess of Tyre, and, and Jezebel uh, was, was an enemy of Israel. And so Tyre and Sidon represented the place not just of the Gentiles, the other, those not in God's favor, seen as not in God's favor, and part of God's plan, especially from a Jewish understanding, but the place of the enemy. Jesus, we are told, goes deliberately into this enemy territory, so to speak, the other side. We also need to recognize that Jesus constantly pointed out the lack 
of faith and the lack of understanding of Israel, of the Jewish people. And we need to note that Jesus constantly challenged the Jewish religious leaders of the day. In fact, the context that we read this passage that we read is, is in the context Jesus has just had a, a run-in with the religious leaders of the day around what makes a person unclean. Because they're accusing Jesus' followers, Jesus' disciples, of, of eating unclean foods. And Jesus says it's not what goes into your body that makes you unclean, but what comes out of your body that makes you unclean. He speaks about the heart and, and the words that we say, the actions that we do. Um, and, and so this is, is challenging to the religious leaders. And, and, uh, and it's in that context that Jesus then leaves Israel and goes out to the land of the enemies, the land of the other. And then we are told, on top of all of that, he encounters this Canaanite woman. And they specifically refer to a Canaanite woman. So, and, and Canaanites represented everything that the Jews considered detestable. The furthest from, from God's grace and love. The Canaanites were not considered by Jewish people, not worthy of anything from God. And so it just gets progressively worse and worse. And it's into this context that Jesus responds. And so Jesus responds to those hearing the story and to those who witnessed it firsthand. For them, it would have been what they expected of a Jewish rabbi. What, the way that Jesus reacted is the way that a Jewish rabbi should have reacted to the enemy, to the Canaanites in the land of Tyre and Sidon. And so when I see this, picture this, I can almost imagine the disciples and all those watching nodding. You know, yeah, this, this one's getting what they deserve. You know, we sometimes do that, right? Uh, when people we don't really like... Uh, you know, get receive something bad, we kind of feel good. And so I can imagine them nodding, yeah, go, go, Jesus. Tell this woman that she is not worthy of anything. But then Jesus turns everything upside down because he says to her, woman, great is your faith. Woman, great is is your faith. Let it be done as you wish. And her daughter is healed. Now healing is a sign of God's life, breaking through the life that Jesus came to bring. And so whenever Jesus heals the sick, uh, it's, it's, part, it's a representation that God's kingdom is among us. So here he's saying, great is your faith. The faith that is outside of what is expected. Faith coming from that person? Never. And yet, Jesus says, great is your faith. In the midst of the, the many times that he's criticized the faith of his own people, here's faith of an outsider. It must have been like a slap in the face of those watching. Great faith outside of Israel? The lesson, I think, would have been learned. And that's why I believe that in some ways this is like a, a lived out parable, an enacted parable. The disciples wanted to get rid of this, this woman. She didn't fit in. But Jesus, and Jesus plays along at first by saying, uh, I was only sent to the Jews. It's interesting to note that when she calls out to him first, 
She calls out to him, Lord, and she calls him son of David. Now, son of David is, is the title that's given to the expected Messiah. It was expected that a king would arise, a king of Israel, like unto David. And so it would be a, the, the, the son of David. And so she comes, this outsider from the enemy territory, comes and recognizes and acknowledges Jesus not only as Lord, but as the expected Messiah. She sees what Jesus' own people have missed. He goes on to say, why should a dog like this receive God's grace? And as I said, at first it's difficult to understand Jesus' response. But we, we need to recognize that Jesus knew people. He had a, an uncanny way of summing people up. I can only believe that he saw this woman's faith expressed in the fact that she recognized him as Lord and Messiah, as Savior and Lord. And he saw this as an opportunity to teach his disciples about God's grace and God's love. Jesus heals the outcast, just as he does in so many other instances. This, in fact, may have been the, the first in, in Matthew's recording, certainly. And so we recognize in this that God's love knows no bounds. God's love does not discriminate. God's love is for all, not just a select group of those favored by God, but for all. And so we must be careful not to limit God's grace and God's love. And then we note as well that the woman did not give up. She recognized who Jesus did. She recognizes who Jesus was even before his own disciples do. Because they haven't yet grasped who Jesus is. They haven't recognized him as the Messiah, the Son of God, the Son of David. They haven't recognized that yet. And, and that must be a bit of a slap in the face for the self-righteous. Those who think they've got it all together. Here's this woman who recognizes Jesus when his own people don't. She was driven by faith and by love. Love for her daughter and faith in the one who she knew was God's love expressed to us. God on earth. God with us. God bringing about God's healing and restoration. And so nothing was going to stop her. She would not accept the discrimination. She didn't give up. In fact, she rejects the rejection. She doesn't become nasty or demanding. She doesn't cower or shrink. She moves forward. She keeps on going until she gets what she wants. In this woman's month, we remember that slogan that those women sang so many years ago. You strike a woman, you strike a rock. Great is this woman's faith. Great is this faith outside of the expected. Great is her faith. Eli Weissel, uh, a Jewish author who lived through uh, the atrocities of uh, World War II and, and was uh, in Auschwitz, one of the concentration camps, was speaking one day on the subject, after Auschwitz, can we still believe? Can we still have faith when we see the atrocities around us? And 
There were the, the stadium was was packed where the synagogue where he was talking was was packed as as many came to listen to the recollections of this man who had survived the furnaces of Dachau. Thin and fragile, Wiesel stood at the podium for nearly an hour, telling one story after another of the horror and despair of those bleak days. His stories were of people confused with their imprisonment and sometimes destroyed with their release. Painfully, silently, the audience relived the events of Weissel's young life when he was the only surviving member of his family. Finally, the stories ceased. His eyes dropped to the floor. There was no sound at all in that mammoth room for what seemed an agonizing eternity. Then he repeated the question, after Auschwitz, can we still believe? He shook his head slowly and sadly. No, no, he said. But then he said, but we must. We can't, we can't believe, but we must believe. We must believe in the face of all that happens to us, that God is still with us. Because if God is for us, who can be against us? Concerning whether or not to have faith, there is no choice. There was none for that Canaanite mom, none for Eli Weissel, there's none for you and me. The message of this wonderful mother, this Canaanite woman, is choose to believe anyway. You may not feel you're allowed to have faith, have it anyway. You may not feel as if God loves you, believe it anyway. You may come to understand that you are not included, include yourself anyway. Even the dogs get the crumbs that fall from the master's table. We must never give up on God's love. God does not discriminate. We must not discriminate. God's love is not limited. We must not limit God's love. God doesn't give up on us. We must never, never give up on God. Amen. As we come to the communion table, as we will in a moment, and as we do regularly, we, we say the words, we are not worthy even to gather up the crumbs under your table. And yet, and yet, God invites us not to just gather up the crumbs that are left for the dogs, but to come to the feast of God's grace and of God's love. The, the Canaanite woman says, even the dogs get the crumbs. Let me have some of the crumbs at least. But she doesn't just get the crumbs. She gets God's life, God's love, God's grace. She gets it all. <clears throat> May we, in the face of all that goes on around us. Never give up. May it be said of us that we are people of great faith. Let's pray. As we go into a time of prayer, I invite you to Think of anything that you need so desperately from God that you'll knock and keep on knocking until you get the assurance that heaven has heard your prayer. This lady is a challenge to our spiritual laziness and lack of passion. She was passionate. She was persistent. She seized the initiative and broke down every barrier. She stayed focused on her main objective. She stayed in pursuit of her objective until the promise was given. 
Is there something that you've been praying about? Something that you'd like the inner assurance that God hears? A promise confirmed. But maybe you've not been passionate and persistent in the pursuit of God's promise. So take a moment to ask yourself, am I really passionate about this? Am I willing to persist until God confirms the promise in my heart? Am I going to overcome and overlook every thought that tries to disqualify me? Am I going to hang in there until I hear from God? In our time of silence, may we be challenged with this lady's faith. Creator God, you made us in your image, and you call us from wherever we are in time and place to be your disciples. Through your Holy Spirit, we are empowered to bring the gospel to all your people. By your grace, you hear our prayers. God of generations, we celebrate the lives of women who fought the good fight and stood up for the gospel yesterday and today. Strengthen our voice of proclamation. God of life, we give thanks for the bold women among us today who serve with a sense of holy purpose in their vocations as daughters, mothers, grandmothers, sisters. Empower us by faith and bless our vocations at home and in the church and in the world. Inspire us to encourage one another in fellowship, laughter, hospitality and sharing. Loving God, we pray for the men throughout the ages who support and encourage women in their quest to use their God-given gifts for your purpose. Give us courage to work together as equals to proclaim your grace and hope. O oh God, our greatest friend, surround us with your love and affirmation through the kindness of others. Be they friend or stranger, young or old, give us eyes to see the love you lavish on all your people. Make us bold to speak your truth and act on behalf of your kingdom with courage and strength of purpose. God of understanding, give us courage to stand up for the abused the needy, the sick, the poor, and the stranger, for the other. We pray for those who suffer in mind, body, or spirit, that you would bring healing and comfort. Inspire us to be your hands to provide for those in need as we are able. O oh God, our help through ages past, we thank you for the gift of wisdom and insight brought to us through the lives of your saints. Inspire us by their witness as we continue their legacy of faith. Holy God of the universe, throughout history, you've given us the courage to form and reform your church against all odds and into pathways as yet unknown. By your spirit and in unexpected ways, you've brought us to this place in the circle of your love. Guide our ways, that we may grow in faith and hope. Make us your bold and faithful children, this day and forever. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Saviour, we pray. Amen. And so let's share the benediction as we bless one another, as we say it together. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. So go in peace, and may God's love and peace go with you. Amen.